Hi, my name is Jonathan Sampson. I am a developer located just outside of Atlanta, Georgia, and I recently came across this uh, neat little game called You Can't JavaScript Under Pressure, and I figured this might be a great opportunity to walk through uh, just the, the five functions that they ask us to fill and maybe explore some of the ways JavaScript works and, and you know, ways in which we can leverage that functionality to solve some of these problems. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Jonathan Sampson. And I host weekly hangouts talking about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript over at uh, Sampson.ms. Um, actually, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll, you'll get prompts whenever those are starting. But uh, without further ado, let's just kind of walk through today and examine some of these questions and, and maybe how we can answer them. So we'll start the game. The first one is a function called double integer. They want us to return whatever is passed into it times two. Of course, this is um, fairly basic stuff. Uh, for those of you who are already a little bit familiar with JavaScript, we'd just return i, oops, we'd return i multiplied by two. So as you can see, once we hit uh, go here, they pass in two, they get four, they pass in 100, they get 200, everything is great, we get to move on. So we're just multiplying the value of i by two and returning that value. Next, they want to check to see if the number is even. This one is actually pretty cool because we get to use the modulus or modulo operator in this one. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is uh, show you a, a quick little demo of what that is. We'll take a number like five and we'll do mod 2, and we'll see that 5 modulo 2 has a remainder of 1. Now if we did a number like 4 mod 2, we'd get 0. So we can tell that if 0 is the remainder, it's an even number. If we actually have a remainder like 1, then we know it's an odd number. That happens to be the exact opposite of what we want here, where 0 and 1 are being falsy and truthy. We, we want to be able to return um, whenever it is uh, return true if it's an even number and false if it isn't. So we need to convert a number 1 and 0 over to a boolean. So what we're going to do is return uh, i mod 2. Now that's going to give us a 1 or a 0. And so what we're going to go ahead and do is negate that with the not operator. So now once we submit this, we actually get all the correct values. Everything is success. This one here, get file extension, you can imagine a string, something like foo.bar.png, for instance, um, or maybe there's not several different, uh, you know, three-letter kind of uh, values inside there. Maybe it's just foo.txt. So what we can do is we can say var split equals, and we'll call i and actually split based on periods inside here. This could return... Um, either an array with two values in it, because what split does is it splits a string into an array based on the occurrence of this string here. So the string foo.bar would become an array of foo bar, like that. And you know, additionally, if we had foo bar fizz, then we'd just have a third value inside this array of fizz. And so what we could do, we're going to go ahead and return um, well, let's see here. We could just say, you know, return split one and assume that they're only going to try uh, strings with one period inside them. That may not be the case because if they give us a string with three values inside it, returning split one is just going to give us bar and fizz might be at the end of there. So what we could do is we could say, uh, you know, split dot length is greater than one and then we're going to call split.pop, which grabs the very last item at the end of the array, or false, because you notice otherwise we send false back. So if split length is greater than 1, uh, we're going to go ahead and return. Actually, we could just do this as a ternary operator. So what we're doing here is split.length becomes, uh, or greater than 1 becomes the condition. If this is true, then we actually return split.pop, which is going to be the last item inside the array. And if this condition evaluates to false, then we're going to return uh, the second portion here, which is false. So you notice all those extensions actually come back, and it looks like they only have values with one period in them. So maybe they're missing out on making this question a little more difficult. This one here is the longest string. It says, I will be an array return the longest string in the array. 
So we want to make sure we're only dealing with strings here. So the first thing I'm going to do is filter the array. So we'll create a variable here called filtered, and we'll say I filter. We'll pass in a function here. That function will inspect each value inside um, the array. And so we'll basically check if return type of value is equal to string. So this will basically create a new array from, uh, for us from the array they're passing in, but we will be filtering out anything that is not a string. So this function will return true if the current value being evaluated is a string, which means it will be preserved and kept inside our filter array. The next thing we need to do is create another array called sorted, and this will be filtered, but we're going to sort it based upon a custom sorting function. And here we're just going to be given two different strings of variable links, and what we're going to do is we're going to return a links minus b links, and so this will return either a negative number, a positive number, um, or maybe something like zero, and that will determine which string comes before which string in the uh, in the final array. So it'll compare two different strings at a time inside the filtered array, and it'll swap their positions around based upon uh, the length or the resulting number from uh, the length of one minus the length of another. And so here we're going to return sorted dot pop. So we're going to return the very last thing inside that resulting array. Looks like that turns out to be well. Uh, this is our fifth question. So they're telling us I will be an array containing integers, strings, or arrays like itself. So we might have an array of arrays. Sum all the integers you find anywhere in the nest of arrays. Okay, so it sounds like array sum, this function that we're declaring here, is going to be a recursive array. So it may, or I'm sorry, a recursive function, which means it may need to call itself a couple times throughout the life cycle of this function. Obviously, if we're cycling over the uh, different indexes of this array, if a child is an array, we'll have to call array sum on that. So what we're going to do is first, uh, we'll create a sum value here, and we will return sum. So array sum returns a number. It's going to be at least zero, but hopefully more. So what we're going to do now is we're going to cycle over i.foreach. Um, yeah, so we're going to cycle over i dot for each. Let's do that. And that's going to give us a value. That value is going to be either an integer, a string, or another array. So let's go ahead and we'll do a switch on value. And we'll say case. Um, I know what we'll do. We'll actually do a switch on object dot prototype dot to string. And we'll call that passing in the value. So what this will do is, if we have, um, let me actually pull up my developer tools here. If we call object.toString, oops, object.prototype.toString, and we pass this an array, for instance, uh, an array with two values of one and two, you notice that gives us back the actual type and string form uh, object array. If we pass in a number like 55, we're going to get object number. And if we pass in a string like Jonathan, we're going to get object string. So that's what we're going to be checking inside this case. So what the first one to do here is a case object array. And if it's an array, what we're going to do is we're going to say sum is equal to sum plus array sum, and we're going to pass in the value. Because again, if it's an array, we have to get all of the integer values from that. Next, we're going to break that, and we'll say case object number. And if it's a number, we're going to say sum is equal to sum plus value. Now, we don't need to handle any other um, examples here because we're only going to be dealing with arrays and numbers. Even though there's some strings in there, we can just ignore those. And so ideally now what happens is we set sum to zero, we cycle over the array i, we do a switch here on the type, that's my dog back there whining, sorry, we do a switch on the actual type of the value, so if the value is object array, 
we're going to call array sum, which is going to go through this whole cycle again for that particular array. Uh, we're going to add all of the uh, integers to this sum, and we're also going to add the result of array sum to the sum. So it might be a little confusing, but let's go ahead and run that, and we're going to return that final number. So you can see, oh, <laughs> okay. I don't know if you can hear that, but there's a uh, rather interesting music playing. This is uh, just an example of you know, different ways we could solve these types of questions. This is a very awkward screen. Um, so you know, feel free to go back through from the start and see if you can explore some other ways to solve these same problems. And uh, you know, perhaps tweet me, share me. Uh, you know, let me know what you you find and different clever ways you can solve these same problems. So thank you so much. And again, you can follow me online at Jonathan Sampson on Twitter. Um, I, this music is driving me nuts, so I've got to stop this video. Take care, everybody. Bye.